so yeah, I, I talked a little bit about um, agency and uh, th this kind of gets into you know, why does bad things happen to good people? Um, when we look at, do we need, do we need Satan to, to cause bad things to happen? No, it's simply because of opposition. And back, getting back to Second Nephi, you quoted uh, um, that uh, verse 16. In verses 11 through 13, it kind of explains it a little more. It says, for it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn, this is the father talking to his son. He says, if not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must need be com a compound in one. Wherefore, it must, it, wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. Wherefore, it must needs that have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. This kind of speaks to me because it tells us that there's a purpose to opposition. There's, there's a purpose to life. And um, God created us. God created everything, this world, for a purpose. It says, wherefore, this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. And if you, have, and if you shall say there is no law, you shall say there is no sin. If you say there is no sin, he shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there, or there be no happiness. If there be no happiness nor righteousness, there is no punishment nor misery. And if all these things are not, then there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not. Neither the earth, for, the, for there could not have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. So... As I said before, um, you know, good is, is the greatest benefit to the greatest number of people. And it's also while simultaneously doing the least harm to the fewest number of people. So when we look at things like the flood, uh, obviously that uh, destroyed the greatest number of people at the time, uh, leaving eight souls on the, uh, the ark to be saved. However, when you look at what they were doing, um, if they were allowed to continue doing what they were doing and having children, um, they would have harmed even more people, uh, more souls coming to the earth. They would have harmed them because of their wicked ways. So they turned from God. Um, when you turn from God, God can't protect you. It's, uh, it's like, you know, why do we have shootings in schools today? Um, well, we've taken God out of schools. How can God protect our schools when, when we've banished God from our schools? So God can protect us when we call to him, when we ask him. He's not going to arbitrarily do things for us. We have to ask him. So when we take or when we turn away from God, he can no longer protect us from Satan and from, uh, from the consequences of our sin. Um, uh, there was a, an example in the Book of Mormon where uh, Nephi, he has to, he, he comes to a choice, and he has to uh, kill a man in order to save his people. Uh, Laban had the records, and of, he had basically the Bible, the Old Testament. He was supposed to carry it away with him in the wilderness and, and to, to save his people so that they'd have a record and a... Um, a knowledge of their God, and they needed that. And it came to the point where uh, God said to, to Nephi, he said, you need to kill this man. And of course, Nephi didn't want to, but um, God told him, he says, behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It's better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. So before the flood, um, they were all in unbelief, and they would continue in that. Uh, God couldn't send his, his good children down there anymore because they would just get corrupted. He had to start over. He had to, he had to uh, save Noah, and he had to 
uh, send his children to a righteous people. And so he needed to have more, he needed to have um, basically start over to do that. Um, he also, when we're talking about um, uh, the Canaanites and how he commanded the people to come in, the Canaanites were a wicked people. They, uh, uh, they were going to continue their wicked ways. They were going to um, continue to war against the Israelites. God commanded them to kill the Canaanites, that they needed to start over, that they needed to have a place for them that they could uh, uh, grow up in righteousness and, and raise their children in righteousness. So evil in a way can be said, uh, it, it's a lack of good, a lack of goodness. Evil can be defined independently from Satan, independently from anything. Evil is a lack of God. God's not there. Um, and so evil persists. Satan can can cause some of that. Uh, he probably causes a lot of the ills today because God can't or because God can't protect us from Satan. Uh, when we turn from him, how do we, how can uh, God protect us when we're not asking him to, when we take him away? So evil is the is the absence of good. And if uh, if we look at you know, this wonderful world that we live in, um, you know, if, if God were evil himself, if Satan, if, if Satan had created this world, what would this world be like if Satan created it? Well, I imagine that we would be probably some sentient uh, germ or amoeba on the planet Jupiter uh, suffering for eternity. And, you know, Satan doesn't want us to be happy. Satan doesn't want us to feel joy. He doesn't want us to, all he wants to do is cause us pain because he's evil. That's an absence of God. So we need to, or so when we look at where we live, we know that God is good. We know that what he's created is good. We need to turn to him. And when we do that, um, we can know and overcome our, our, uh, our trials and our sorrows, and we can have joy. And God wants us to have joy. And that's one of the biggest ways that we know that God exists is because we can have joy. Um, if he was an evil God, we couldn't have joy. So we know that it's through Jesus Christ that we are able to be connected back to God. We're separated from him now because of the fall. So we can be connected back to him through Jesus Christ and his atonement. And how do we know this? Well, we know it through preachers. Um, Paul taught in Romans 10, 14, he says, for those or for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So Paul says, um, you know, you have to hear about Jesus in order to believe on him. And you can't believe without hearing a preacher. And you can't have a preacher unless somebody's been sent. Well, the apostles were sent by Jesus, and uh, they called bishops. And, of course, the, they had carried out the missionary work. Uh, they called bishops, and they set up a church. However, bishops were never called or they're never supposed to call other bishops. When you don't have uh, apostles calling bishops and setting up churches, you have an apostasy. You have uh, no bishops, no church. Joseph Smith, of course, was called, I believe, was called by Jesus. He was uh, also called by Peter, James, and John. He had his hands laid on him. He was called as an apostle. He was able to be, uh, to restore the church. And there were witnesses to those callings you have about 30 seconds left. Okay. Um, so witnesses to those, those that calling, and um, it's through those witnesses that God reveals his church and God reveals his, his truth. So Joseph Smith was able to restore the church because he was called and he was sent.
All right, so let me go turn my timer on. All right, when it comes to Noah's flood and the wars against the Canaanites, many people do not see the love of God. I think it's a shame because it revolves around a misunderstanding of why these events occurred. Many people think God was just punishing people because they were uh, behaving badly, but that's not true. Let me begin by reading Genesis 3.15, which says, I will put enmity between me and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and shall, thou shall bruise his heel. Notice that the seed of the woman is literal. It is in reference to Jesus Christ. So it follows the seed of the serpent in the text is also literal. So in Genesis chapter 6, where the flood is pronounced, it tells us that the sons of God, which the Bible refers to as angels, saw the daughters of men, which are human women, that they were beautiful and took them as wives as they chose. We are told that their children were known as the Nephilim, and they were on the earth in those days and also after, which is important when we get to the wars in Joshua. Now Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and it is said he was just and perfect in his generations. The Hebrew word for perfect is used elsewhere to talk about genetically pure and spotless animal sacrifices. Noah, in other words, was 100% human. We are told that these angels have been corrupting flesh and on the earth. Satan, in his attempt to stop the seed of the woman, had some of his angels attempt to rid the earth of any humans to stop God. God acted and flooded the earth, killing the Nephilim, leaving them without a body as demons. For God did not create the demons, neither are angels referred to as demons. The Apostle Paul makes mention of this when he tells women that they should have a head covering because of the angels. Those angels that had relations with humans in the days of Noah were put in everlasting chains of darkness in a spirit prison, as recorded in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude chapter 1, verse 6. After the flood, another group of angels rebelled in Sodom and Gomorrah, as Jude records, as the people went after different flesh. We see an example of this when the people of the city wanted to have sex with angels rescuing Lot and his family. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but there were still Canaanites who contained this hybrid mix of human and angel among them. God would later have Israel eliminate the Nephilim entirely from the promised land by commanding complete destruction of them. When it came to human tribes, God wanted Israel to avoid war with them by proclaiming peace, and if they did not accept, the women and children were still spared. God commanded no genocide against any humans, God was even merciful to humans among the Nephilim, such as Rahab, who he saved, and the virgins who still had not defiled themselves with the Nephilim. Genocide was only done to the Nephilim to preserve humanity and allow for the birth of Jesus Christ through the human mother. Despite only being mere humans, men like King David, by God's strength, were able to overcome these demigods like Goliath and others. All right. So let me go ahead and ask you questions. So for the freshness of mind, we did it the opposite way around last time. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So how could a loving God kill innocent children who and not give them opportunity to exercise their free agency? Well, first of all, you uh, misunderstand that uh, they don't get free agency in the spirit world. Uh, we believe that they do have free agency there, that they will continue to learn and grow. And so what happened was they simply um, got a chance there. They, they would uh, uh, skip this life for the next where they, could have be, where they could be taught about Jesus Christ there and learn to accept him there. So you're, so you're saying that the children um, agreed in the preexistence to die early and to so they so they didn't get the opportunity to have uh, life experiences and make choices of good and evil. I don't know exactly if they agreed to it or not. It was just something that uh, I'm uh, that we assume that you know we assume that this life is is the only thing that we have when we know that the next life the the, the uh, um, 
it, it's the land of the dead, Hades, the land of the dead, is where we will continue to learn and grow as spirits because we are spiritual people coming down, experiencing a temporal existence, uh, spiritual existence is coming down as a temporal existence. And we will continue to be spiritual even after we leave this life. All right. Is um, God's love unchanging between the Old and the New Testament? Is his love the same? We believe that God is the God of the world, that God uh, uh, loved the Old Testament just as much as he loves the New. And uh, he is the God from the very beginning. We believe that uh, Joseph, or that Adam and Eve have the same gospel that we have today. All right, so when it comes to the greater good, does God still operate on the basis of greater good when um, pouring out judgment? Yes, he does. Okay, how do you know what is the greater good? Uh, because it's his judgment and he knows best. <laughs> All right. And I mean, if it, if it occurs, then, you know, then we're, we're trusting his judgment is, is for the best. Is there any evil in doing the greater good? Is there any, yeah, just like cutting out uh, cancer, you have to harm the patient in order to cut out the, the cancer. All right, that's uh, the last of my questions for you. Okay, um, so interesting uh, with your uh, views on the Nephilim. Um, what, what is your definition of enmity? Um, it's conflict, essentially. It's what? Uh, conflict, if I'm not mistaken. Conflict? Yeah. I'd okay. have to look it up just in case I'm um, going off a bad definition of it. As I understand it, enmity means hatred, but yeah. I'm just curious. Um, opposition, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's an opposition between Satan and the seed of the, the woman. Uh, how does that then if there's that enmity and that opposition there, mm -hmm. and these were, these were, these daughters of, of uh, man were part of the seed of, of Eve. Yeah. How do we get Nephilim then if God placed enmity between us and the seed of Eve or between well, it's, us it's, and Satan? Well, it's Satan's war against humanity and, to try and keep uh, Jesus from coming and, and mimicking God, trying to make his own creation. Satan went and had some of his angels rebel against God and corrupt the human flesh and the flesh of animals as well. Okay, and you're saying that Noah was the only one that escaped the genetics of the Nephilim? Well, Noah and his family, um, the scriptures don't, give much reference on how many humans were still left on the earth. But this has been a teaching from the early Christians. Also in the book of the fir first book of Enoch, it mentions this event as well. Yeah, I'm just kind of like, I, I know a little bit about it. I've just, yeah. uh, it surprised me. So um, how did they get through Noah? Yeah, I mean, if, if God wiped them all out in the flood. How did they become the Canaanites? Well, there was another group of angels who rebelled. I believe these angels are the ones that are in the Euphrates, possibly, um, that are locked there. But these uh, other group of angels came down in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's mention of going after strange flesh, as the King James puts it. But in the Greek, that word strange just means different. So not referring to homosexuality as most people would assume but referring to something that wasn't human okay um do we have nephilim dna uh no god had israel wipe out the nephilim but there is some well, how do we know that we we do know that <laughs> from uh from the scripture but yeah, so I mean, well, no, I mean, the, the women and children were spared. How how do we know that? Uh, how how do we know everybody was wiped out? These Nephilim were wiped out. Well, when it come, when you're talking about the Book of Numbers, right? That and when the the Israelites didn't wipe out the women and children because they spared them out of their own good. So those Nephilim, if they had Nephilim DNA, 
uh, they weren't wiped out. That's that's what I'm trying to. Well, understand. they wiped out. Well, the Bible talks about them wiping out the, these Nephilim. Um, when you get into Judas, Judas would fit a description of the seed of the serpent as far as him, but there isn't any other mention as far as during that time. But there is speculation that they will come back, and that's what Daniel was referring to as the iron and the clay mixing together in the last kingdom. Okay. And as in the days of Lot and Noah, so. I, uh, I'm done with my questions. Okay. <laughs>